I'd like to begin this evening, uh, I'm going to talk about Iran and Israel tonight uh, 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 principally, but I wanted to begin this evening with a few reflections on the operation last week against Osama bin Laden. Um, uh, nearly two years ago, and I had uh, my uh, office check the date on May 26, 2009, President Obama called Director Panetta, myself, and Mike Leiter, the head of the uh, uh, National Counterterrorism uh, Center, uh, to, uh, and myself to the Oval Office. Uh, the bin Laden trail had gone cold, and the president told us in no uncertain terms to expand and redouble the effort to find him and to make it the intelligence community's top priority. Uh, dedicated professionals painstakingly scrutinized thousands of pieces of information until we found a man we believe it was bin Laden's trusted courier and began to track his movements. This was really the work of, uh, of uh, uh, dozens and hundreds at the end of the day of intelligence professionals, which I'll talk about in a second, across really three administrations. In the months leading up to the raid, uh, we combed the intelligence, worked over the options, met regularly with the president on the way ahead. And as the process culminated, uh, having served three presidents, uh, I was struck about uh, as to how quintally, uh, quintessentially presidential this decision was. On Thursday night, the 28th, at around uh, 7 o'clock, the president left the Situation Room, where he had received his final briefing on the various possible courses of action. In that room, the president had received divided counsel from his team and told us he would make a decision soon. That's not unusual with something this complicated, and, the, and a president wants to hear counsel, and he wants to hear honest opinions, and that evening the, the council was divided. This is a difficult uh, decision. The president stood up, walked out of the Situation Room, walked across the colonnade, past the Rose Garden, and went to his residence uh, to make this decision, his decision alone. And the next morning at about 8.20, he asked uh, uh, me and a, a couple of my colleagues to come over to the diplomatic room and told us it's a go. And that's what strikes me now, that we ask our presence alone to make these exceedingly difficult decisions. And at the end of the day, 300 million Americans look, look to him to make the right decision. And as long as I'm in Washington and as many of these episodes as I'm involved in, uh, I become increasingly struck by this, frankly. We all know the outcome, uh, but I wanted to make uh, tonight uh, five observations about uh, the, the operation and some of its implications, if I might, before I get to the body of my uh, talk. Uh, first, the decision-making was truly emblematic of President Obama. It was intensely rigorous. He challenged assumptions. He pushed the analysis and the intelligence to make sure we actually knew what we thought we knew. We held more than two dozen interagency meetings, and the President personally chaired five National Security Council meetings in the Situation Room in the six weeks leading up uh, to the operation on May 1. When it came time to decide, there were a number of options on the table, courses of action, as the military likes to, uh, likes to call them. Uh, the President chose to launch the raid that you are all so familiar with uh, now, the helicopter raid deep into Pakistan uh, to assault the compound and act against Osama bin Laden and those who were harboring him. The President chose the raid, and I wanted to talk about this for a couple of, a couple of minutes, as to why he chose this course of action. Uh, as opposed to others, which may have been less, uh, less risky. Uh, one, he wanted to limit the risk to civilians uh, inside, with, inside Pakistan and around this compound, which we did. Two, we wanted to be able to prove we found who we were looking for, and we didn't want to just buy ourselves, frankly, a propaganda battle about the, uh, the outcome here. And three, and this turned out to be uh, much more important than we even possibly could have thought at the time the decision was made, he wanted to be able to exploit any intelligence found at the scene, and I'll say more about that in a second. One more comment on the process under this first observation. Our team was able to maintain absolute operational security. Through months of work, not a single leak. It's a tribute to the team, the President's leadership of the process, the seriousness of purpose with which uh, our government leaders went about this, and it was a key to the success of the operation. Obviously, if there had been any leak, Osama bin Laden would have been out of there. Uh, and we would have uh, undergone this operation at extreme risk to our uh, operators. Second observation, the special forces who carried out this operation performed brilliantly. Our view, and the President said this on 60 Minutes the, the other evening, was, and this is the way intelligence works, there are not, there, you know, there are, uh, these are assessments. Uh, you're balancing the information you have. The information in this case came from all manner over the, of, of intelligence sources, interrogations, detainees, human sources, other liaison services, uh, technical sources, and you weigh this. And at the end of the day, it was our view there was about a 50-50 chance that if we launched the operation, bin Laden would be there. 
But what gave the president the confidence, I think, to go ahead uh, with the operation was his 100% faith in the abilities of our special operators who have conducted hundreds of these kinds of operations. And the uh, interaction between him uh, and these operators during the course of consideration of this, I think, I, I think really did build tremendous confidence uh, in their ability and their, the, the prudence and the uh, care with which they go about these operations, considering all the contingencies. And there were a couple of these contingencies that came up during the course of it, which uh, we were very happy that the, that the operators had planned for. As the president said when he met uh, last Friday at Fort Campbell, uh, this group is the, is the greatest small fighting force in the history of the world. This is also one of the great achievements in the history of the intelligence community, a success that, we year, that was years in the making, and as I said, across three administrations, which is why the president's first two phone calls after he learned that our operators were safely back in Afghanistan, his first two phone calls were to President Bush and to President Clinton uh, to review uh, what had happened and to tell them that the United States had uh, successfully launched an operation against bin Laden and bin Laden had brought justice to him. Third, as a result of the raid, we, we have the single largest trove of intelligence ever collected from a single terrorist leader. The intelligence community tells us it's the equivalent of a small college library worth of material. It's rather remarkable. Based on what we now know, we have tens of thousands of video and photo files, uh, millions of pages of text, uh, which if, uh, the intelligence community tells us if they were stacked would be tens of miles high. One fact is already crystal clear. Osama bin Laden, from the intelligence in our initial review, uh, Osama bin Laden was not simply a marginal or a symbolic figurehead in this organization. In fact, he remained an operational commander, a person directly involved in strategy, operations, propaganda, and personnel. And that's why, as I talked about earlier, the decision to pursue the assault option mattered uh, so much. And that compound in Abbottabad, Pakistan, we got uh, uh, quite a bit more than just uh, Osama bin Laden, which leads me to my, first, my fourth point. It, as of uh, late 2010, and we said this at the end, during our review that was released at the end of the year, we assessed that Al-Qaeda was at its weakest point since 2001. The successful assault on the compound was a strong blow, obviously, against the organization and an important milestone on the way to Al-Qaeda's strategic defeat. But Al-Qaeda faced other challenges as well, and I think this is very important given everything else that's going on in the Middle East. It faced an ideological challenge, a narrative challenge, which I think is very important to focus on. The Arab Spring presents Al-Qaeda with a potent ideological challenge. For its entire existence, Al-Qaeda's message has been that violence is the only path forward. It's never had an affirmative program which speaks to the aspirations of people in the Middle East. And it could not have been further removed from or relevant to those who came to Tahrir Square in this past January. My fifth observation on the uh, uh, bin Laden uh, raid, I didn't mean to give a whole other speech, but I, I thought it'd be interesting to share these, uh, to share these uh, comments with you. Uh, fifth, and finally, uh, our actions sent a powerful message. Now, I want to, I want to go beyond the specifics of this operation and its impact uh, in the Middle East and, and uh, on Al-Qaeda. It sent a powerful message uh, to our friends and adversaries that we do what we say we're going to do. It's a message of persistence and determination and dedication, no matter what the obstacles the United States does what it says it's going to do, across presidencies and political parties. And the United States has the capabilities to do so. And these capabilities and this message were on full display a week ago Sunday. And that is an absolutely important message that resonates across our strategic interests globally. <laughs> Now, now the, the, the determined pursuit of bin Laden is not the only example of where the administration seeks to match and has matched its words with action. I want to turn to Iran. Uh, we also do what we say on Iran and are pursuing this uh, with similar uh, persistence, dedication, and uh, perseverance. President Obama has long understood the regional and international consequences of Iran becoming a nuclear weapons state. And that's why, as a matter of policy, plainly stated, we are committed to preventing Iran from developing nuclear weapons, period. From, from his first days in office, President Obama has made clear Iran has a choice. It can act to restore the confidence of the international community in the purposes of this nuclear program by fully compli complying with the IEA and Security Council resolutions, or it can continue to shirk its international obligations 
which will only increase its isolation and the consequences for the regime. There's no escaping or evading this choice. Already Iran is facing sanctions, and we have put an enormous amount of energy into this, as those of you who study this know. Already Iran is facing sanctions that are far more comprehensive than ever before, and as a result, it finds it hard to do business with any reputable bank internationally, to conduct transactions in euros or dollars, to acquire insurance for its shipping lines, to gain new capital investment or technology infusions in its oil and natural gas infrastructure. And it has found that, uh, that in that critical sector alone, energy and gas, close to $60 billion in projects have been put on hold or discontinued. Other sectors are clearly being affected as well, and leading multinational corporations, understanding the risks of doing business with Iran, are choosing no longer to do so. These companies you've heard of, Shell, Toyota, Kia, Deutsche Bank, UBS, Credit Suisse, to name a few, and the impact is real. Unless and until Iran complies with its obligations under the MPT and the relevant Security Council resolutions, as I said, we'll continue to ratchet up this pressure, working with our uh, allies and partners around the world. As the President said, Iran can prove that its intentions are peaceful, it can meet its obligations under the MPT, and achieve the security and prosperity worthy of a great nation. It can have confidence in the Iranian pe people and allow their rights to flourish. For Iranians, are heirs to a remarkable history, but the choice is theirs. That's why, with all the events unfolding in the Middle East, we remain focused on ensuring that Iran does not acquire nuclear weapons. But as you all know, the Iranian, nuclear, Iranian regime's nuclear program is part of a larger pattern, and I want to talk about this for a couple of minutes, of destabilizing activities throughout the region. In Iraq, where our former general uh, commander there, General Ordierno, said last summer, quote, Iran continues to be involved in violence specifically directed at U.S. forces. In Syria, where it has helped the Assad regime suppress pro-democracy demonstrations, and in Lebanon, where it continues to arm Hezbollah. So make no mistake, we have no illusions about the Iranian regime's regional ambitions or their activities. We know that they will try to exploit this period of tumult. They didn't cause this period, by the way, but they are trying to take advantage of it. And we need to remain vigilant. But we also need to remember, and this is what I wanted to talk about tonight, that Iran has weaknesses and vulnerability. And at this point in history in the Middle East, this is a very important thing to focus on. There are competing narratives. There are competing models in the Middle East right now. And Iran's model, like the Al-Qaeda model, as we talked about a couple of minutes ago, lacks a vision relevant to our times. It's a model that could not be more out of step with the sentiments of the Arab Spring. And I wanted to think about this systematically for the talk tonight. And I put forth, uh, in my judgment, four characteristics that the Iranian model currently has in the path that they're on. One, a corrupt and misguided and isolated economy that offers the younger generation little hope for a better future. It's increasingly working for the security services, like the RRGC and elites, and not for the people of Iran. Number two, the denial of basic human, uh, the human right of freedom and expression, the very liberties people across the Middle East are prepared to risk their lives to claim. Three, a political leadership focused on preserving their reign at all costs, unleashing violence against their own citizens rather than enabling their citizens to flourish. And fourth, and I think really importantly, the pursuit of policies that have increasingly made a great civilization and people in isolated state, increasingly unable to carry on basic interactions with the rest of the world. So it's no surprise then that Iran's worldview bears little or no resemblance to the movements afoot in the streets of Tunis, Cairo, Benghazi, and Dara. Iran's leaders attempt to declare themselves the inspiration for these demonstrations, but it's belied by their own hypocrisy, demanding justice for others while crushing their own people's demands. Our observation is that since the two elections in um, June 2009, the regime has been heavily focused internally on silencing dissent, dissent and preserving itself. And as you might expect, we now see fissures developing among the ruling class, a dispute that has nothing to do with me and the needs and aspirations of the Iranian people. It reflects a fundamental question, whether Iran has the confidence to engage with the outside world, a prospect that it has been offered and that it is in the overwhelming interest of its people. As the President said to Iran's leader, leaders, quote, we know what you're against, now tell us what you're for.